Right, I'm here to talk to you today about um, graphene, which is my area of research. It's what I do at the university, me and my research group, and about 100 other people at the University of Manchester are working on this exciting area of material science called graphene. So I'd like to tell you something today about, a little bit about the story of graphene, what it is, try to explain um, its properties to you and what it can do for you in the future. So the first thing uh, I'd like to say is um, graphene, the important thing, if there's one thing you take away from my talk today, is to understand what a two-dimensional material is, which is what graphene is. Uh, a two-dimensional material, everything in the world around us that you see around us, is three-dimensional, which means it's got a length, it's got a width, and it's got a height. Graphene, on the other hand, is a two-dimensional material, and it looks something like this. This is, a, this is not, obviously, it's not graphene. It's a molecular model of graphene. What you see here are the black dots that you see are carbon atoms, which are connected together in a hexagonal chicken wire-like structure. And a sheet, a single sheet of carbon atoms like this is called graphene. But why do I say it's two-dimensional? What I invite you to do is just open your mind a little bit and imagine that you are an electron living on this sheet of graphene. And you're moving around. You're trying to get around from one atom to the other. What you'll find is that your motion is restricted to move in two directions. Normally, you can move back and forth, left, right, jump up and down. But if you're an electron in graphene, you can only move in two directions. And that's one of the reasons why graphene is a two-dimensional material. Now, if you take graphene, uh, if you think of it as a sheet, and you stack the sheets up, then you get graphite. The name must have sounded familiar to you when I said graphene, because the name graphene comes from graphite. And how do you know graphite? From that. Graphite is the stuff that's found in the lead of your pencil. You also use graphite in nuclear reactors and batteries. So it's been around for a long time. So we have graphite, which has been around for a long time. And then we have graphene, which uh, is a rather recent um, discovery made at the University of Manchester. So graphene was discovered at the University of Manchester uh, in 2003, 2004 using a very, very simple technique. People have actually been trying to make graphene for a long time. It was not something that somebody came up with one day all of a sudden. People have been trying to make graphene because it was a new type of material, a two-dimensional material with very, very unique properties. But ultimately, two gentlemen from Manchester University, called Andre Geim and Kostya Novoselov, came up with a very, very elegant way of making graphene which was to take um, sellotape, sticky tape, and um, put it down on graphite and peel away the layers. You can think of it as cutting a deck of cards, for example. If you take a deck of cards and you, cu you start cutting the deck, the, the deck of cards is like graphite, it's got many layers. You keep cutting the deck, ultimately you'll end up with one card. How do you do that on a nanoscale with graphene? You take graphite, put some tape down on it, some sticky tape, peel it off. You get some layers away. And then you put it together again with another piece of sticky tape and you peel it again. And you get some more layers off. So it becomes thinner and thinner until ultimately you get a single layer of graphene. And what do you do then? It's on the tape. You put it down on whatever substrate or whatever object you want to put it down on. And then you dissolve or remove the tape and you have your graphene, which you can then play with. And that's basically what we have been doing for the last 10 years or so. We've been playing with this new toy that we got our hands on. And it's been very, very exciting. Now, but that's not really uh, all that science is about. It's not just that we make something cool, we play with it for whatever number of years, um, have our little bit of fun in the lab and then move on. We also need to try to take that science and progress it into something useful, something that you might be able to use, oh, sorry, something that you might be able to use in the um, lab, or in, in your household um, every day. How do we do that? So in order to do that, we need to go from making these little small pieces of graphene to making a large quantity of graphene. 
And there are many ways of making large quantities of graphene. And the next slide I'll show you another way by which you make a lot of graphene. What you do there, basically, is called chemical vapor deposition. So you take a, a surface of some metal, let's say copper or nickel or something like that, and you can grow graphene on this layer of metal. So this is the scaling up. You start in a small way with these flakes of graphene, which might be hundreds of microns in size, about as thick as your hair. A single flake of graphene might be about as thick as your hair. And then we have to make square meters of this stuff so that we can actually use it for something. So we take this metal, and then we take a gas, like um, methane, for example, which contains uh, carbon, heat it up, the, heat the substrate up to about 1,000 degrees, and flow the gas over the substrate, and you get a layer, a coating of carbon on the surface, which is a single layer of graphene. And then you can um, coat the layer with um, a polymer, and then peel that polymer off, sort of like a really big piece of sellotape, and then put that down on another surface, and then you get graphene. So this is one of the ways by which um, you can make a large amount of graphene. There are other ways by which you can make a large amount of graphene. For example, you can take graphite. I told you that um, graphite is many layers of graphene. You take a chunk of graphite, a rock of graphite, you put it in water or some other liquid, and you blast it. You blast it with a huge amount of energy, usually ultrasonic energy, and you shatter. You just, the, the, graphene, the graphite breaks up, and you get a, a liquid, something like this. You get a black liquid. It's like ink almost. So you get a black solution in water and other solvents, which is what we call graphene solution, graphene ink. And you can then start using these things, because that's the point at which things actually become useful. When you have made enough of the material that I can hold up a bottle of it and say, right, we have enough of this material now that we can actually use it for something. But before we even get that far, we need to actually find it. Before we can use it, we need to find it. And the serendipity, science has always um, has serendipity in it, which is um, accidental things that happen. And the discovery, the invention of graphene, or the isolation of graphene, was one such event. So when, when I told you about how they used the sellotape to make the graphene, it wasn't the first time anybody had tried that. People had tried that before. But what um, Gaim and Novoselov did was they figured out the correct surface. If you put the graphene down on particular surfaces of silicon, you can see it very easily. If you put it down on certain other surfaces, it becomes very difficult to see. And you might wonder, how did they figure this out? Well, that's where the serendipity comes in. They just happened to have the correct surface or the correct sample in the lab that day. So they got very lucky in that sense. But then, once they figured this out, they went on to do so many wonderful things. They went on to measure the properties of graphene. And so let's go over some of these properties. What makes graphene so exciting? Why are we so excited about it as scientists? and also um, as members uh, of the, the users of graphene, potential users of graphene. You'll see on, on the slides a long list of properties. I'll mention some of them. It's the strongest material in the world, much stronger than diamond. It's the thinnest material in the world, as you can imagine, a single sheet of atoms. It's the lightest material. It's the best conductor of electricity, much, much better than copper. The best conductor of heat. It is almost completely impermeable. You can't really get anything through it, etc., etc. So it's got all of these amazing, almost completely transparent. So it's got all of these amazing properties. And more importantly, it's all these properties rolled into one thing. This one material which has got amazing, amazing properties. But when I put this slide up, the um, thing I always would like to draw your attention to is right at the bottom, you'll see there are three dots. That is the most important part of the slide. Why? Because that represents all the things about graphene we still don't know. And literally every month, every year, we're discovering more and more things about graphene that we didn't know about before. So this is not the final list. The list is going to keep getting longer and longer and longer. And that's the excitement of science that drives the scientists forward to research this material. But we also go um, beyond graphene. I told you graphene was the first.
two-dimensional material, uh, but now we have other two-dimensional materials. We've discovered that you can take other materials, like, which are like graphite, made up of layers, and pick out single layers out of them, and then put them together to form new materials. Think of it as a Lego. That's, it's, it's molecular Lego. We have different colored blocks, different layers of different materials. We stack them up and make things which are new, and this is really new. One thing we, uh, we notice as scientists, we think we're very clever and we go off and do something, we're very proud of ourselves, only to realize that nature beat us to it by about a million years. So every time you do something, you find that nature has already done it somewhere. But I think this is a very good example where as scientists, we've done something, this artificially layered materials, which I don't think you can go anywhere in nature and find a stack of graphene boron nitride, molybdenum disulfide, graphene boron nitride. I don't think you're ever going to find it anywhere in nature. So this is very unique in the sense it's a real, true, genuine, man-made material, something that we've never had access to before. So, right, we've made it, we've studied it, We've got a list of properties, but what can we then use it for? What good is it? What good does it do for, not just for scientists to have some fun with, but for the users? One of the most exciting applications of graphene, potential applications of graphene, is in display technology. Every um, phone, every tablet in this audience that you might have has got a coating on the surface which has to be transparent and conducting. And I've told you before that graphene is transparent and conducting. In fact, it's very difficult to find materials which are both transparent and conducting. And the reason for that is the same property which is responsible for conductivity is also responsible for absorbing light, which is the number of electrons. But graphene and very few select materials have this property of being transparent and conducting. So you could think of using a coating of graphene on your phone for making the touch a sensitive layer. But graphene has another property which you can add to the mixture, which is that graphene is flexible, it's bendable. You can stretch it, you can twist it, and things like that. So you can actually make bendable screens, bendable uh, devices using graphene. So, um, I, I mean, this is not fantasy. You might think it's fantasy, but it's not. That is a graphene screen. It's a graphene screen which is bendable. I can hook this up to my phone, uh, this is a prototype, and we have prototypes of these things floating around. People are developing, companies around the world are developing these things. So it's not something which we are just imagining. You can also think of graphene electronic paper. You might have your Kindle or, or, or whatever, but it's still a block. You still can't, you can't really roll it up or fold it up and put it in your pocket. But we're working on graphene-based electronic paper, which might be a Kindle that you can roll up and stick it in your pocket one day. So that's the sort of display applications that uh, we're very, very excited about. And then there are some other applications of graphene as well, uh, which will impact everyday life. You have graphene can be used for energy purposes, which is a very, very hot topic today. You can use graphene for making solar cells. And again, we have uh, some examples in the lab. You can use graphene um, for trapping the light that falls on it, converting it into electrons and holes and then creating energy from that. You can also use graphene as a photo detector. What a, fo a photo detector is a fancy way of saying a camera sensor. When light falls on graphene, it generates a current, and you use this current to decide what kind of light has, is it a red light or green light, and then it acts as a sensor, a photo detector. So that's one sort of area, one application that graphene can be used for. Uh, the energy is very, very important. Um, you can also use graphene for composites and coatings. A composite is something that um, comprises of two materials. You take plastics, for example, mix the graphene into the plastic, and it becomes better. It becomes more conducting, it becomes stronger, it becomes more stretchable. And you can use uh, that for structural applications. For example, most modern expensive cars and Formula One cars are made of carbon fiber composites. You can do graphene composites, coatings, uh, protective coatings like covering a surface to protect it from corrosion, for example. You can also uh, store the energy that you've just made with the graphene uh, battery, uh, so the graphene solar cell. Uh, you can store it in a graphene battery. You can take the 
graphene to make the electrodes of the battery and you can store the energy in the battery and the, the expectation is that this graphene battery will be thinner, lighter, faster to charge, faster to discharge, can get more power and potentially even power vehicles, not just uh, personal electronics. So graphene batteries and supercapacitors is a very, very big area of research. The other thing you can do is um, filtration, which is another major area of research into graphene at Manchester University. We make graphene filter papers. Graphene filter papers can be used for separating salts from water, like desalination, for example. But um, this was an interesting story that we had. Um, this is, you can think of, uh, sort of get your head around how the media goes about things. Um, we said we can use uh, graphene for separating alcohol and water. We were thinking biofuel production. Uh, the media went with vodka distillation. <laughs> so um, priorities. So graphene, uh, graphene membranes is another interesting area. Graphene sensors. We can use graphene for detecting molecules. So if a molecule of some kind falls on graphene, then uh, the graphene properties, the properties of the graphene will change and you can use it as a sensor in life sciences, biology, chemistry, etc. So that's another exciting area of research. Just the last couple of things. Um, the two chaps that did this brilliant work have, of course, won lots of awards since then. And won, they've won the Nobel Prize in 2010. They are fellows of the Royal Society. They've been knighted. So it's a big deal. This, every university around the world now has a graphene research program. And it's a very, very big area of research thousands, tens of thousands of scientists around the world working on graphene. But the thing is, it's not something inaccessible. It's not something just scientists can do. One of the things I do is public engagement. And I go around universities, and I go around schools and science festivals with a microscope, piece of sellotape, some graphite, and I give it to the people in the audience. And I tell them, make your own graphene, and we'll take a look at it. So watch out for that, the science festivals, uh, Manchester Science Festival, for example. It's a very good place for you to come and make your own graphene. Anybody can do it. Even a nine-year-old girl can do it. So everybody here can, no problem. The last thing is um, somebody, some of you might have noticed at the corner of uh, Upper Brook Street and Booth Street, there's a construction site. That's going to be looking like that in about a year's time. That's the National Graphene Institute, something that we're very proud of a uh, complete research center dedicated to graphene research with about 100 people in there. So Manchester will continue to be the center of graphene research development and technology um, in the world. And so I just want to leave you with that. And thank you all very much for coming here to listen to me.